territory on the far left coast. You're listening to On The Move with Max Morley III. Hello, MacPack. It is great to be back with you. It's been a long time. It feels like it's been a really, really long time since I've had an opportunity to sit up here and talk with you guys. By the way, uh, for those of you who are new to the program, my name is Mac Worley III, and this is On The Move. This is the show that attempts to inspire you to stand up for your rights. We talk all sorts of different topics, uh, but we focus on liberty, guns, government, those kind of things. A lot of politics will be discussed. Uh, But anyway, uh, without further ado, today's show is titled RFRA, hashtag Boycott Indiana, Freedom of Association. We have special guest Mark Delphine. He's going to be joining us today. This is episode 67 of our program. And uh, first of all, I just want to thank you guys for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. Uh, You're probably doing that one of a few different ways, uh, but... Anyway, I just want to say thank you for, for taking the time to actually listen, get involved, things like that. Uh, I also want to give a shout-out to our uh, listeners over on haywiregulch.com. Thank you so much for tuning in, guys. I appreciate it. Uh, and for those of you who haven't done this so far, I would appreciate it if you just uh, head over to spreaker.com forward slash on the move show. That's a platform that we broadcast uh, primarily. That's our uh, you know one of our hubs. The main hub is, uh, is on the move show.com. You can listen every Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that's that's when we when we broadcast. That's where we do all of our stuff. So you can check it out there, or you can listen directly on Spreaker. You can follow us there. You can check us out at Haywire Gulch as well. So uh, lots of different ways you can do it. Of course, you can also listen to us on YouTube. And for those of you that do that, I do appreciate that. So um, anyway, uh, some of the topics we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the boycott Indiana movement. Uh, the hashtag boycott Indiana. Give you guys my take on it. Uh, and see what you guys have to say if you have anything you want to chime in on and give us your opinion. Uh, in addition to that, I want to talk about the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, uh, give you you know my thoughts on it, uh, and I'm going to talk about the freedom of association. And, and also, I want to get to the religion of statism. I'm looking at it as, a, as a, really a religion nowadays. It seems like the, the further along that we get, you know, the, the, the more it does become uh, dogmatic. I want to talk about its dogma. I want to talk about some of the things that that make me think that it's a religion. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing your guys' thoughts on that. I'm looking forward to to interacting with you guys. Also, if uh, if you guys have any other topics that you want to bring up, feel free. Give us a call. The number of the show is 360-450-5625. Again, that's 360-450-5625. Or you can email us at talk at onthemoveshow.com. Message us on facebook.com forward slash onthemoveshow or tweet us at onthemoveshow. Um, and we got a, a bunch of other topics we're going to cover here. I got a stack of articles that I'm waiting to get through here. Um, I'm really excited. Today, we are going to be joined by special guest Mark Delphine at 515 Pacific Standard Time. It's 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Or I'm sorry, 8:15 Eastern Standard Time. Um, Mark's a good friend of mine. I really like Mark. He's a, he's really just a smart guy. Uh, but he he ran for uh, U.S. Senate in 2010. Um, he, ha- he has a finger on the pulse of libertarian philosophy. He's I mean, he knows his stuff when it comes to, to libertarian philosophy. I've actually learned quite a bit just from talking to him. And um, He's also the founder and the CEO of uh, this, this company called Equality Funds, and he's going to talk about it and, and, and basically give you guys some background on it, but it's a really awesome company. I actually helped him do a, a promo video for it, so you can actually check that out if you go onto their Facebook page, uh, and he'll give you all that stuff in a little bit, but good guy. Uh, I, I really enjoyed working with him when we did that, uh, that promo video and everything. And he's just, he's just all around a uh, good guy, so he's going to give us his take on uh, some of the stuff as far as the RFRA and freedom of association and i'm really looking forward to to hearing from him so uh as usual like i said you guys can join the conversation number of the show is 360-450-5625 again 360-450-5625 and uh before we move forward here guys i got some big news that i want to tell you um you know i've things have been kind of up in the air about this and we finally just made things official and uh i i really want to to share this with you guys you guys are like an extended family to me and it's you know i I don't want to i don't want to i really like my privacy but i don't want to keep this stuff from you so um we're actually going to be taking our program on the move and moving so uh and i hope this doesn't uh, upset anybody out here in the pacific northwest we we have loved being out here um 
you know, I, I've, I've made some just incredible friends. You guys are just awesome. I'm telling you, uh, lifelong friends who I know I'm going to stay in contact with no matter where we are. But, uh, my wife and I, you know, I'm 30 years old now. We were talking about having kids and, um, it's just gotten to the point where, you know, the vast majority of our family is in the Midwest. And, you know, it, we, we were used to being away from our family when I was in the military. And there was, uh, you know, it was just one of those things that, okay, well, we're, we're away from our family. And, you know, we'll have kids when we settle down and we put down roots and things like that. But then, you know, we, we came out here to Washington. And this is really the first time that by choice we were away from our family. And I don't know, it just feels kind of kind of selfish to, to be this far away from the vast majority of both of our families. And especially when we're talking about having kids. Uh, you know, it, it, I, I really want my kids to grow up around their family and be able to, to, you know, hang out with their cousins and go over to grandma's house and all the stuff that I enjoyed doing as a kid. And, uh, yeah, so, so we're going to end up moving back to the Midwest. Um, you know, it's, it's something that we've talked about for quite a while, uh, but we've, we finally decided we're going to be making the move uh, relatively soon to be uh, towards the end of this month. So anyway, I, I just wanted to give you guys a heads up. I hope you guys out here in the Pacific Northwest, you know, don't just you know, suddenly hate me because we're leaving. <laughs> but I, I, I really, I really do value you guys uh, and, and I appreciate it. And I'm definitely, just because I'm not going to be living out in, uh, in Washington, that doesn't mean that I'm suddenly going to stop caring about, you know, politics out here and, and gun owners out here and the, the liberty movement out here. Obviously not. I've got, got a lot of roots in here with you guys and and I definitely plan on staying in contact with you guys, and I hope you guys stay in contact with me, and I hope you guys don't forget about me just because I moved out to the the Midwest. But anyway, I wanted to share that with you. Some big news. Uh, you know, it's it's going to be crazy and hectic, and there may be a week here where we don't have a podcast uh, when we're in the in transit. But uh, I just wanted to give you guys a heads up. That's what's going to happen. We're going to be setting up shop, have a have a new Mac Shack, so to speak, <laughs> and. Uh, that's going to be our, you know, our new broadcasting location. I'm, I'm going to have to change the intro at some point here. It can't be broadcasting from, uh, you know, the left coast, as, <laughs> as it says. We're going to have to figure out something else. Uh, any of your suggestions, by the way, feel free to comment and let me know. I'm interested to, to, for you guys' input. This is, like I said, this is your show just as much as it is mine. So, uh, anyway, I want to move on here, and I want to talk about just a couple of quick stories before we have Mark on. Uh, that kind of caught my eye this week, and I want to kind of get your guys' to take on it, see if you guys even heard about this. Uh, but anyway, the first story is about dog poop, oddly enough. Uh, so apparently, this is this is coming to Seattle, uh, a Seattle near you here. Uh, they are actually DNA testing dog poop, and uh, I, I I find this pretty crazy. Uh, let's see here. Actually, there's a video loaded on the website. It's about to play. And I had to turn off. There we go. Okay. So, all right. So anyway, th- what is actually happening with this is that they're DNA testing dog poop to identify the dogs who are pooping in apartment complexes. And, you know, the, the, the owners of these apartment complexes are, are forcing their tenants to pay a one-time $29.95 fee for DNA testing. So they get the DNA samples of all the pets that are in the complex. And then when they f- see that there's a pile of dog poop somewhere, they go and they... DNA test it, and then they charge that person a fine. Okay, and I think this is this is particularly interesting. Uh, you know, for, for me, I would not submit to this kind of thing. Um, uh, you know, you guys know how I feel about that kind of stuff, but I I wouldn't submit to this, and I would probably just move out of the complex unless it, I had it played again there that video. Okay, so unless I was already like had already signed something in in my agreement or something I probably wouldn't wouldn't let them DNA test my dog I just think that's kind of Orwellian and strange and weird uh, but according to this you know uh, one person was fined five times in one week that's over five hundred dollars um, and and they're doing this as a, as a way to make people uh, clean up after their dogs um, you know obviously I agree you should clean up after your dog's poop but uh, I don't. I wouldn't want to live in this kind of <laughs> this kind of complex. If, if you're if you need the DNA of my animal or me or so, you know, if you're dealing with DNA, I, I just don't want to be a part of it. It's too Orwellian for me. I would just wait until my lease is up and then go. Uh, and I, I find it interesting that they they said uh, that's why in February uh, 2014 the tenants have been paying a one-time fee of 29.95 for the DNA testing. So I'm wondering. Did they all pay it uh, willingly just in the middle of their lease? Did they do it so all the leases timed out at a certain time and then they they started all the leases that way? 
I don't know, but you know, I think a private company has every right to do what they want with their private property. However, I don't have to live there. And if I'm already in, a, in an agreement with you, in a contract with you, I wouldn't accept you changing the contract uh, in the middle of the game. It's, cha- it's basically changing the rules of the game while the game's being played. Uh, I, I wouldn't allow that. I would probably just move. That's just me. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm curious to see what you guys have to say about that. Uh, interesting fact here. Uh, there are about uh, eight, uh, 811,000 dogs in Seattle, apparently. And... Uh, it has 50 percent more dogs than kids. Uh, an average study said dog poop weighs one third of a pound, and the dogs in the last three—I'm uh, sorry—the dogs in those three county regions are responsible for two two hundred and sixty-eight thousand pounds of droppings a day. So, uh, anyway, you know, it's it's something to think about. But I, I certainly wouldn't want my uh, my dog to be DNA tested. I just, that's just weird. And then you're getting fined for it. Ugh. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, I got I got an even crazier story here. Uh, I got a man who was thrown in jail for not mowing his lawn. Man thrown in jail for not throw, uh, for not mowing his lawn. Uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, kind of weird and ridiculous. But this is uh, CounterCurrentNews.com. Uh, this is an article that was written on April 4th, 2015. And I'm looking for the author... Uh, Jack, oh, yeah, Jackson Marcinia, something like that. Uh, anyway, so uh, he was he was uh, fined and he couldn't pay the fine. It was seventeen hundred dollars when he was fined last September. Uh, since there was no way that uh, this individual could pay the fine, he took vacation days uh, at the Southeast Campus uh, for. Tarrant County College, where he is an electrician, by uh, taking all the vacation days at once. This allowed a replacement to fill in for him while he spends the next 17 days in county jail. So his crime was that uh, he violated city regulations of uh, Grand Prairie uh, that lawns may be as high as 12 inches, but Rick's daughter, uh, Angel, explains that this new regulation wasn't familiar to her or her father. And, you know, they, they, they like to use the excuse that uh, ignorance of the law is no excuse uh, unless, you know, it's a it's one of the uh, you know police officers or something that are that are violating your rights. And they say, oh, they didn't know something along those lines. So, you know, that, that I think is very important to, to to clarify here. It's funny when. You know, a citizen is ignorant of the law. That's no, it's suddenly no excuse for being ignorant of the law. But if an officer, they violate your rights, suddenly, you know, being ignorant is okay. And, and you know, there are some, some court rulings to back up that precedent. It's kind of scary when you think about it. Uh, but anyway, at this point, we're going to go ahead and cut to a quick commercial break. Uh, when we get back, I believe we have Mark Delphine on the line. And if this is him, we're going to go ahead and take that call as soon as we come back. So, all right, guys, we'll be right back after these messages. Do not go anywhere. Oath Keepers is a nonpartisan association of current active duty military, reserve, guard, veterans, peace officers, and firefighters who will fulfill the oath we swore with the support of like-minded citizens who take an oath to stand with us to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So help us God. Join us at OathKeepers.org. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashaworley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. Yes. 
blasting from deep within occupied territory on the far left coast. You're listening to On the Move with Mac Worley III. Stand up, speak out, and get on the move. And now your host, Mac Worley III. All right, we are back, and we have, I believe, this is Mark Delphine on the line. I'm going to go ahead and unmute the Skype call. Hey, Mark, you there? I sure am. How are you? I'm doing great. You know, I, first of all, I just want to say thanks so much for coming on the show. Um, you know, we've we've talked about this before, and, uh, you know, it's it's really exciting for me to have you on. I, I really support the, the program that you, uh, you're you doing, the, the company that you're starting with, the Equality Funds. And uh, before we get into all the other politics stuff, would you mind just uh, explaining what Equality Funds is and, and why people should care about it? Sure, sure, absolutely. I mean, I think the idea behind Equality Funds was really started with the idea that companies – could legally discriminate against the LGBT community, of being the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community. And if you could legally discriminate against a class or a community in this country, and yet you do not, it's a signature of how you treat your people in general. So what we do is we screen companies based on a particular criteria that if a company is LGBT friendly, we believe that those companies are going to be a higher performer in the market. And over the past 10 to 12, 15 years, the companies that we've really looked at that have really been more quote unquote gay friendly have been a higher performer in the market. And we think that that's a measurement as far as how people approach in terms of, you know, say hiring practices, um, policies and procedures. I mean, all of that kind of thing is really encompassed based on how the human rights or the human resources does for its people. I mean, so in other words, companies that treat people better tend to do better in the market. And that's where we really based the crux of the company. Exactly. And I think a lot of that is, has to do with free market solutions. Wouldn't you agree? You know, a lot of people don't want to give money to, you know, uh, people that are discriminated against others, right? Well, it's stupid. I mean, it really is. I mean, the whole point of it is, is that it's really dumb business to discriminate against a certain class of individual, whether it be for race or for gender or for sexuality or for whatever community. If you're really just identifying and discriminating against a particular community, it's bad business. I mean, in this day and age, people tend to want a company that's going to support their own values. And with some minor exceptions out there, the majority of the companies that we invest in the majority of the companies that do well in the market are the ones that treat their people better. And so really the measurement is if you don't legally have to treat people better and yet you do anyway, we feel as though that's a good measurement of how you're going to perform in the market. Okay. So, so let me ask you, I've been hearing a lot of chatter, even within our own, uh, our own group here. Uh, there's been comparisons made uh, from the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Uh, they, it has been compared to, let's say, uh, Jim Crow South laws. And I'm just curious, uh, what do you think about that comparison? Do you think it's, it's the same? Uh, what, what are your thoughts? I understand why people think it's the same. I do. The, this evokes a lot of emotion. Anytime you're talking about discrimination, anytime you're talking about discrimination in the workplace or anytime you're talking about discrimination in the market, if people have the freedom to discriminate, I think the insecurity is out there that people will do so. Where I'm a little bit more optimistic for, I guess, business in general and capitalism in general is that I don't think people will. I think it's a stupid business move and I honestly feel as though if you really learn from the mistakes of profit and losses based on economics, you're not going to discriminate. So Jim Crow laws in themselves, I mean, way back when, I mean, were based on something completely different from what I think this particular law is based on, where when you're talking about civil rights, I don't know that I would necessarily put this particular bill, this Indiana bill, or um, anything like a Religious Freedom Restoration Act in that same category of civil rights. I think a lot of people will disagree with me, but I think it's the kind of situation where Businesses in this particular category are allowed to discriminate on the basis of act versus on the basis of, say, a class of people. And all of this was really generated by the idea of marriage equality, or in other words, 
the government is basically saying, you know, we can't discriminate on the basis of an incenting adult entering into a contract to marry another person. Mm-hmm. And so when a government comes in and says, okay, you can't discriminate on that basis, a lot of people got a little bit afraid, especially the more religious right. And those people were, were basically saying, you know, what if I don't want to serve a gay wedding? What if I don't want to be a photographer for, gay, for a gay wedding? What if I don't want to bake a cake for a gay wedding? Do I have to? And I think this is in response to that. And while I think, it's, again, I think it's just stupid business. I mean, it's in this day and age, it would be very dumb to discriminate on that basis. I still think you should have the freedom to do so. It shouldn't be illegal to be a bigot, even though it's stupid to be a bigot. Does that make sense? Absolutely. You know, it's just like any other thing, like any other right, even if you don't plan on using it or, or, or asserting that right, I think that just because I, I disagree with it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it, that it should be illegal. And, and I think that is a, it's such an easy jump to make when, you know, it, I, and I made this comment before earlier throughout the week. I was talking to somebody about it. Is uh, you know one thing I have noticed is that a lot of the reason why things start to get banned or laws start to get made is there there becomes a majority of people who don't do that one activity and they find it distasteful, even though it's not violating anyone's rights or uh, or depriving somebody uh, of of their you know of their rights, hurting people in those kind of kind of ways. Even if it's not doing any of those things, they, 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 this majority of people could make that illegal. And I think, I think it's interesting when those kind of things can be turned on people. I was having a conversation with uh, with some Christians who who thought that you know uh, I think it was, we were talking about polygamy, um, and you know they were talking about how they they thought that polygamy should be illegal. And I you know I was just thinking it's easy to turn these kind of things around. So you know what would you do if as a Christian or something you know so the vast majority of Americans weren't Christian. And they decided that it was distasteful and they didn't participate in that. And they decided that even though you're not hurting anyone or depriving others of rights, that they were going to make Christianity illegal. You know, that I, I just think tyranny of the majority is wrong in all cases. As, as long as you're not hurting others or depriving others of rights, I don't think that the law should come into play anywhere. Well, I think the majority of the people out there that are against this RFRA Act in Indiana believe that this is discrimination, and they do believe that it is violating people's civil rights. The reason why I I disagree, even though I believe that these people have sincere intentions, is because of the fact that we're basing this discrimination on an act versus on a community of people. And really getting back to what your prior statement was, is that we really aren't a democracy necessarily as we are a constitutional republic. And I mean, granted, I mean, this is just semantics, but the idea of what a constitutional republic is versus a democracy is that a democracy is 50 plus 1 percent basically deciding the majority rule of everyone else. Mm -hmm. And I think somebody, I'm not sure if it was Winston Churchill or some other prominent figure that said democracy is the worst form of government except all the others. (laughs) And where I think the United States Constitution really is so instrumental in this is that it is a constitutional republic. In other words, our rights are protected regardless of whether or not the majority feel as though it should be. So this can go either way. And I mean, if you really think about it, I mean, if, say for instance, you know, I mean, the majority of people for some reason enacted slavery again, I mean, it would be a ridiculous notion, but let's just say for instance, 50 plus 1% said so. That's why we have courts to basically come in and say, no, this is wrong. We do not allow this kind of thing because it's a violation of individual rights. And that's where I really think that this plays in, is that this is about individuality and about a religious freedom for people to basically say, if I don't feel comfortable doing something, I shouldn't have to do it. Now, again, I think it's stupid business to discriminate on that basis, but those are discriminations on the basis of acts. So I don't want to bake a cake. I don't want to make or I don't want to take photographs. I don't want to, you know, put together a floral bouquet for a, for a wedding. And that's primarily the, the reason for this act is based on the marriage. So, and so th- there are some major differences, I think, between this and, uh, for example, Jim Crow South laws. Okay. Um, uh, f- first and Clearly. foremost, um, Jim Crow South was, was state mandated. So that was you had to you had to have segregated uh, facilities. You, you couldn't integrate at all. And that was 
punishable by by law if you violated that. So uh, this is obviously not punishable by law. These are discretionary choices that people can make. But in addition to this, the RFRA requires somebody to has have a verifiable religious conviction. So it can't just be you know somebody deciding that they, they suddenly uh, you know are, are against something or they they make up a religion on the spot. It has to be something that they can prove in court uh, that 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 they were being discriminating for this specific religious exemption and the if it's not verifiable enough it can the, the judge can decide no uh, you were guilty and you're in violation of the law right i mean the idea of, uh, really of this is in my opinion principle versus whim if you really just look at this and say look on the basis of my own principles i you know and honestly again i mean i and happy easter to everybody i mean the idea of this coming on this day in terms of a major Christian holiday, and I mean, I'm not a very practicing Christian, but I understand and I respect a lot of Christians out there who were looking at this and saying, look, you know, this is just against my religious beliefs, and I get that, which is a principle, whereas I believe that a lot of people on the other side are saying, you know, hey, you know, I want to be coddled, I want to be protected, I want to be taken care of, I want to be protected in a way that, um, even though I don't believe that the law actually says this, I believe that the whim comes out and says, well, you're discriminated against me, and this is wrong. And again, I don't believe that it should be wrong. Let me, let me backtrack. The idea that if you are owning a business in this country, it is your own personal right to your own pursuit of happiness, your own property. And so if you own a business, as much as, again, I think it's absolutely ridiculous business to discriminate on any basis, if you want to make money, which is really what people are doing for business, the idea of it is, is that you should be able to say, I let in who I want to let into my business. I discriminate based on what acts that I perform in my business. And the real litmus test here is, are we discriminating against people? Or are we discriminating against acts? So if you and your wife went into a bakery in Indiana and said, look, I want to make a cake that says, say, Adam and Steve forever. You're a heterosexual male. Your wife is a heterosexual female. You both go into this bakery and say, hey, look, I want to make a cake for a wedding, even if it's just hypothetical. I mean, it doesn't even matter. And if the bakery says, look, you know, we don't feel comfortable with that, that's the act. They're not discriminating against homosexuals because they're heterosexual, you see. So the idea here is really against the act itself. And so that's why I say, again, even though it's stupid business to discriminate against those acts, it still should be your freedom to do what it is that you want to do in your own business because the free market will work itself out. You will pretty much be labeled and ostracized, boycotted. And if not, then maybe that's the majority opinion and that's where democracy in that particular case might rule. And, Does that make I mean, any sense? I'm no, it, it, it makes perfect sense. And in that case, I, you know, democracy really is a, a free market solution because, you know, if, if the people in that community support that kind of business, you know, that then that is a smart business decision. If the people don't, then it's not. And I, I think that just as a society now, you know, we, we've gotten to the point where we don't really tolerate intolerance that much. And, and it's kind of really surprising me coming from the left – uh, how intolerant they are, you know, it, it like it's it doesn't seem to me like this is this is about equal rights anymore. It seems to me like this is about special privileges, about, um, you know, forcing others to capitulate. Uh, would you disagree with that? A little bit. And only with respect that I don't think it's left versus right. I think it's secure versus insecurity. If you are confident in your own abilities, if you're confident in your own self, you really, you know, I mean, honestly, because I'm a gay man, I walk into a restaurant or I walk into a bakery, and if somebody literally says, look, we don't serve your kind here, I mean, sure, I might be a little bit offended. I might be like, wow, you know, that really sucks. I mean, what a stupid business move. I'll never do business with you again. I'll tell everybody about you that I don't want to do business with you. I might even call the media to do so. The real thing with this, in my opinion, is that should you get the law involved? Should you get the government to come in and basically say, you can't do this? In other words, aren't you secure enough with your own shopping habits? Aren't you secure enough with your own self to basically say, you know what, there are going to be some bigots out there. There are going to be some jerks. There are going to be some you know, people out there that don't agree with you and that you, know, you don't want to do business with. 
And what I've been telling a lot of my friends on the left or a lot of my LGBT friends is that, do you really want to enrich and reward a business for being a bigot simply because of the fact that if they are legally banned from discriminating, in other words, they could basically have these thoughts and these feelings, and you wouldn't want to do business with them if you knew about it. But because of the fact that what they're really trying to say is, is this act should be banned, then pretty much what you're doing is thought policing. And you're basically saying, I don't think people should think this way, and so I'm going to ban that. And even if they do think that way, and it's banned, then people shut up, they do their business. But yet, because of all of the choices that we have in this day and age, even in Indiana, even in, say, the rural parts of Indiana, you can still buy something online, you can still go to a neighboring town, you can still basically get what it is that you're trying to get somewhere else. And if not, the free market will allow itself to bring in a competitor that will basically say, hey, look, this particular town is full of a bunch of people that does not agree with gay marriage and they don't want to serve, you know, a gay wedding for, say, a cake or a photographer. Guaranteed, somebody's going to walk into that space and say, oh, I'll do that. And they're probably going to make a lot of money doing it. And that's the beauty about the free market is, is that people will be enriched and reward based on what the public sentiment is, based on what it is your buying habits are. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I happen to agree with you wholeheartedly on uh, the the concept of it being a, a bad business practice and, and the, the whole idea of getting the government involved. I, I personally, I don't think that discrimination should be illegal. Uh, I think uh, discrimination is actually a, a good thing in terms of, and I know that sounds weird, but in terms of allowing the market to know who the bigots are. I, I, I want to know. I, I mean, personally, I want to know who I'm giving money to. If, I, if I'm dealing with a bigot, I, I would prefer to know. That way I can take my business somewhere else. I don't want them to smile at me while they're, you know, w while they're hating what they have to do, but the, the government is you know, forcing them to do it. Otherwise, they'll go to jail or lose their business or be involved in a lawsuit or uh, whatever myriad of reasons it is. I, I don't want them to be silent and to do something against their will. I want them to discriminate against me so I know and now I can take whatever action I, I choose be it uh, you know letting my friends know hey this, this guy's a racist or a bigot don't go over to that guy uh, don't waste your money there because somebody down the street is doesn't hate your guts you know <laughs> so the well, you, exactly as a business owner I've told several people it costs seven times more to go and gra grab a new customer or a new client than it does to keep the existing one happy so if you're really pissing a lot of people off, if you're really making waves in terms of your community, and in this day and age, it's a global community. It's not just in your own rural town. People find out about this stuff. For instance, that pizza parlor that basically said, you know, and this was, in my opinion, so blown out of proportion, and also the fact that they're making so much money on this kind of situation, when really a journalist came up to him or to her and said, would you discriminate on this basis? Now, let's just say, for instance, she had nothing against homosexuality. All she said was, yeah, we probably wouldn't make a pizza for a gay wedding. Well, uh, you know, I'll just go ahead and throw this out there. I'm completely generalizing, but I know for a fact the majority of my gay lesbian brothers and sisters have nothing to do with a pizza for their wedding. And so the <laughs> idea is, is that really I think it was just blown out of proportion. These people were getting death threats. These people were getting threats of boycotts. And, I mean, here's the thing. I'm all for boycotting. I'm all for saying, hey, look, you know, I'm going to pick at your business if, you, if I disagree with you. If you really have enough time on your hands and you want to go out there and you want to pick it, that's freedom of speech. But in that same respect, it's also where freedom of speech, not even just freedom of religion, it's freedom of speech to say, you know what, I don't want to serve people of this particular ilk. And so I am a contrarian in that respect and saying, I think you should be able to discriminate on any basis because I think it's stupid and it will really weed out the bad players in the business from the good players. And so I think we've been around this multiple times, but the idea really here is, is the insecurity that somehow you're going to have storefronts that say no gays allowed, just like what they were saying is, you know, no colored or, you know, black, white, you know, black and white water fountains, etc. And the idea really what you had said, and this is the nail on the head, is that you're allowing businesses to make that decision 
versus the government coming in and mandating a black versus white water fountain. Exactly. You know what I mean? Because the government, the government has a monopoly on force, whereas businesses don't. You can simply choose to do business with them or not. And the problem with it is, is that people will draw straws when it comes to the idea of, oh, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm going to go in there and, you know, I mean, all of a sudden there's going to be calamity because everybody's going to discriminate. I really am not that pessimistic. I'm very much more optimistic because if you really study the law of economics, Profit and losses are really what determines economics, and losses are much more important than profits. And people will lose much more if they discriminate than if they don't. So uh, I want to take a moment here because you were talking about this pizza joint. And this is actually uh, – it's Memories Pizza. I believe this is in Walkerton, Indiana uh, that they, they had this happen in. And it, this is actually a very crazy story for those of you who don't know anything about this. Um, a, a media reporter came into this this random I'm using air quotes here random pizza parlor uh, that has you know Christian stuff out. It's it's obviously a Christian owned uh, business. So they they were basically targeted for their religious belief. They found they probably did a Google search Christian owned businesses somewhere in that town, and then they went to the first one that popped up. And um, Anyway, so, so they go and this reporter interviews uh, the people there and asks them if, you know, do you do any catering? First of all, they don't do any catering. They've never catered anything. And uh, it's certainly not a wedding. Who would have pizza at a wedding unless it's maybe for exactly. some, some kids? Uh, but the, the, the point is, is that they were asked this hypothetical question of something that they don't do. And they were asked, if you were asked to, to cater uh, a homosexual wedding, would you do it? And they said, well, you know, we would, I guess we'd be forced to say, no, we couldn't do that. They didn't even discriminate against anyone. They just said in this hypothetical question that that violated their faith and they couldn't do it because of that. So I, I just want to give you guys a heads up out there in listener land here. What happened? There was some fallout from this, uh, this Memories Pizza situation. Uh, they were getting phone calls like every two minutes of people that were angry, and they were getting threats, and there, it was basically making it impossible that they could take an order to, to take pizza from the amount of phone calls they were getting. Uh, so they had to close their business cause they're, it, for a few days until everything settled down. Uh, and there has been a GoFundMe page created for these guys. I just want to give you guys a heads up because, Mark, you were talking about you know profit and loss in, in, when it comes to business. GoFundMe.com forward slash Memories Pizza. The last time I heard about this was like three days ago or something like that. They had raised $74,000. Uh, it was well more than that. It's, it's well over a quarter million. I'm, I'm looking at it. I yeah, I'm looking at it right now. It's closed. After four days, it's been closed. There were 29,166 people that raised $842,592. This is insane. So it, you're talking about profit and loss here. Obviously, there are people that, that support this kind of stuff. So, you know, the, 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 these people that are donating are probably like you and me to, to where the point of we just don't like the idea of, of people trying to use the government or use force, uh, even if it's just to, to try to blackball a company to, to stand uh, to, to stand up and shut up against uh, what they believe, what goes against their, their beliefs. I personally you – know, I. I I'd probably, you know, I, I don't have any problem with with any company saying that they don't want to associate. And honestly, for religious beliefs, I'm not going to stop going to a, a, a restaurant just because their religious beliefs say that they can't participate in a in a uh, like a, head, or a homosexual wedding. Now, if they said they if they're like doing the uh, what do they call that Baptist church the. Um, you know what I'm talking about? Westboro. Westboro Baptist Westboro. Church. Yeah, so if they're, if they're saying that, you know, God hates gays or something like that, then yeah, absolutely. I don't want anything to do with that company. But I'm not going to sit there and say, you know, you have to protect the rights of, of homosexuals, but not the rights of, of, of people who have strong, verifiable convictions in their religion. Uh, I think it's just a terrible idea to actually get the government involved in that situation. And I think that both religious rights and, and, and you know, uh, sexual orientation rights should be protected. I think that this is one of those situations where, you know, uh, religious rights meets those kind of rights. And it's just, it, it comes in a conflict. I don't think one outweighs the other. What, what do you think? Well, I think really, and I, I'll, I might get myself in a lot of trouble for the saying this, but I really think what this is is really about silencing your critics. A lot of people feel as though the Christian religion is very hypocritical, and I, for one, definitely agree to a certain extent. There are a lot of things that are very hypocritical with 
a lot of quote unquote Christians today that are basically saying, you know, we're against gay marriage, but we don't have a problem with divorce or we don't have a problem with, Mm -hmm. you know, a daughter back talking her dad or something like that. I mean, you know, there's some very ridiculous passages in the Bible, in my opinion, that are not the infallible word of God that basically a lot of people look at and say, you know, this needs to be silenced. But the problem with it is, is that when people try to silence your critics, it's essentially like book burning. Don't let anybody hear you or hear your opposition. Don't let anybody listen to what it is that anybody else is saying. You shouldn't pay attention to the other side. You should only listen to what it is that we're saying. And while they might have good intentions behind that, the results are disastrous. Because when you try to silence your critics, and eventually you're going to be the critic that is silenced. And that's the problem with all of this is that people will, I mean, let's just go ahead and call a spade a spade. I mean, when you look at the idea of the Muslim faith and I mean, how horrifically anti-gay certain Muslim countries are when it comes to homosexuals and even women. And I mean, the idea that, you know, Apple, the company, comes out in opposition is CEO Tim Cook comes out in opposition for Indiana's bill and law and basically says, you know, we don't want to do business in Indiana, we're going to boycott it, but yet they're doing business in Saudi Arabia. You start to think to yourself, are you, I mean, are you really serious? I mean, the, the idea that you can basically try to silence critics, even though you're not even consistent in your own approach, when you start to look at it and say, there is a religion out there, and granted, don't get me wrong, I mean, as a gay man, I mean, I have had a lot of discussions with a lot of Christians about how I'm going to hell and how God is not forgiving of that kind of a lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera, which I think is bogus, but you know what, people, are, you know, they have their right to believe that. But when you start to look at another religion and say, I mean, blatantly they are discriminated against this particular community, and yet nobody really is talking about it. I mean, when people are cutting heads off of people that are gay in certain countries. And yet Indiana is basically saying, you know what, if you don't want to bake a cake, it's okay. And yet they're being, I mean, the whole state is being boycotted. I mean, how could you imagine living in some state like that in Indiana when you really don't even think that way? You're just like, look, I just want freedom to be able to do what it is that I want to do. And so... Yeah, yeah. I I mean, I couldn't agree more with it. And it really, you know, your argument kind of made me... um made me think of a, a few other points here because when, when you're talking about using the government to silence your opposition because that's what this essentially is is that people have you know it, people have some convictions and they don't want to violate those those religious convictions so they're using the government to censor and basically shout down these people at the same time uh, that to me I think that's a form of fascism is to, to you know use the government to silence your opponents. Uh, I, I completely disagree with, with trying to shout people down. I, I love conversation and debate, even if it's about, you know, it's a side that I completely disagree. I'll let them hear their, their argument. We'll, we'll have a, a rational, logical debate, and I, I will try not to get emotional. I hope they do the same thing. But, it, you know, in terms of, of religion in itself, you know, what we're talking about here is people with a verifiable religious conviction that they can, they can prove it in court. And we're not talking about the, the hypocritical religious people out there who, who basically believe in, you know, religion a la carte. You know, and, and this, go, this goes to all of, uh, all of religions out there. I mean, it, it's easy to pick on Christians because there's, there's so many of them here in America. But the, there's so many other people. Like, I know, I know Muslims who won't eat pork, but they they have no problem, you know, drinking alcohol and, and having sex with girls, things like that. Like that, that, that stuff's right. not an issue to them. Uh, but it's, it's religion a la carte. You know, that, that's what, what happens. But we're not talking about those people in this circumstance. We're talking about people who believe in their convictions and, and they are honestly willing to die for them. So I think including the government is just a recipe for disaster because when you make something against the law, essentially what you're saying is that if, if push comes to shove, that person can be killed for, for violating this law. And then you're dealing with religious zealots to, to the point where you know, they, this is what they believe. This is, you know, they actually believe in this. Uh, I, you know, I think it's a recipe for disaster. Somebody's going to die, and I, and I'm not, and that's not even anything disparaging on on the religious uh, religious act, aspect of that. I think, I think if this is what you believe, believe in it. I don't think anybody has a right to force you to violate your beliefs. That's just outrageous. Well, you know, I mean, honestly, I'll go one further, and I will disagree with you a little bit in that this really does have to do with how things were before. And I mean, if you really look at it, I mean, 
the reason why I don't call myself a conservative and why I call myself a libertarian is, is that I believe that conservative values, primarily religious values, have been the, uh, say, the law for quite some time. In that people have, you know, I mean, when you're dealing with, say, gay marriage, I mean, marriage licenses were started, your origin of them was to start was started because of the fact that they wanted to stop black men from marrying white women. And so, I mean, when you're looking at the government coming in through, and that's primarily a religious situation, though, Mac. I mean, mm-hmm. there were a lot of very conservative, very religious right-wing people who were basically saying, we don't believe that our white women should be married by, you know, married to black men. And so we're going to go ahead and, and enlist licenses so that we can basically discriminate it on the basis. So, so, and so for, for decades, even centuries, what we're looking at is, is that a religion has basically dominated the political landscape. And yet now, because the tide has shifted, that governmental involvement or intrusion is now being used against the same people that were using it against us. <laughs> And when I say us, not only just the LGBT community, any minority, any individual per se, because of the fact that religion has really dominated that discussion. So I will say that this isn't just the left situation. This is a, the left is responding to, in addition to the fact that they are, I mean, I think it's very whimsical. I think it's very irrational in terms of how people are really reaching out and saying, you know, this is going to be another Jim Crow. This is going to be, you know, no gate allowed in front of, uh, you know, in front of a business front. I mean, that's ridiculous. I don't think that will ever happen in this day and age. And if it does, most likely that business will go out of business. Well, uh, but again, you know, it know, is a response, in my opinion. Uh, well, I notice a common denominator here, and, and that is the use of the government uh, on both sides. Yeah, I think on both yeah. sides, when you use the government to, to force people to do things or not do things against their will, you know, if they're not hurting others, if they're not depriving others of their rights the government has absolutely no business to be in here and you know for it, I, you know i will disagree with you to the point of where I, you know i th- there are obviously i'm not i'm not right or left you know i i consider myself to be libertarian i have some conservative leanings i'm not a religious person myself but i I happen to deeply believe that people should not be forced to violate their religious beliefs. I'm not religious myself, but I, if I was, I wouldn't want somebody telling me that suddenly now I have to do something in violation of something that I believe in deeply and that I'm willing to die for because it's my belief. I mean, that, can you imagine if somebody told you that you had to do something completely against your beliefs that you are willing to die for there there'd be no way that a government would ki- would convince you to do it it doesn't matter what the punishment is you will you're willing to die for this now you know i, I agree I, and that's the thing though max is that i don't think we disagree i mean the idea is, is that i'm very much in support of the first amendment which is the freedom of religion there's also a freedom from religion in an in aspect in which where i think my left or liberal brothers and sisters, <clears throat> will basically say that if you're open for business, you should be open for business for everybody, and that you shouldn't be able to discriminate. I completely disagree with that, because I believe that, say, for instance, if I'm a, if I'm a, you know, a black man owning a, a business where I have KKK members walking into it, and people will roll their eyes and go, oh, that's just ridiculous, but really, where is it that you draw the line? I mean, all of a sudden, now I have to serve these people in hoods? Now, when people say, well, you know, homosexuality is, a, is not a choice. I mean, it's actually a, you know, it's a lifestyle and you're born with that. And so they're trying to, and they're basically trying to push their morality on people, which I totally agree with. I mean, I believe that this is not a choice. I never chose to be gay, but I did choose if I did want to, I would choose to get married. And so that's an act that I'm choosing to do. And just because of the fact that, I mean, I think what the majority of the people who disagree with this Indiana law would basically say is, is that it's not really fair that you can discriminate on this basis considering the fact that it's now legal. But I disagree with them. I believe that, you know, you should be able for whatever reason to discriminate and say, no, I refuse to serve you. I don't like you. I don't, I I don't like your, I don't like your haircut. I don't like your glasses. I don't like your shirt. You know, even to the most extreme, I don't like your skin color, your religion, which I think is ridiculous. But all I'm saying is, is that when you own a private business, it is not a public business. Mm-hmm. And that's the distinction here. Just because you're open to the public doesn't mean as though you're a public business. If you were a public business, like a park, now I can completely understand you cannot discriminate and say gays are not allowed in the park, whereas everybody else is. 
Mm -hmm. That's a major distinction. You see that? Uh, Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, we're talking about the difference between public and private property at the same time. But what if it was a private park? You know, and honestly, again, I think it's stupid because, I mean, if you were really to discriminate and say, you know, gays are not allowed in the private park, I I mean, what kind of a moron does that stuff? But, I mean, if you did, I would still protect your right to your own freedom of speech and your own religion by saying, you know, I really don't believe that, you know, this is my land and I let people in it whether or not, you know, I mean, that's the whole point. You don't have the right to go into a business. The business owner has the right to allow you in. And that's the major distinction here, whereas I think people are trying to flip this on its head, and that's where I think you start to get into the entitlement mentality. You start to get into the idea that, you know, we're owed something, and just because something is open means that I'm entitled to do business there, whereas if I'm a business owner, I should be entitled to say, no, I don't serve your kind. As stupid as I think it is, you should still have the right to be a bigot. And I totally agree. I think that, you know, we all have that right to to choose who we associate with. This ultimately, to me, comes down to the freedom of association. You know, we have it is. we have that right to, to choose. Do I want to be affiliated with this or not? Uh, you know, it, and and at the same time, I don't think that we should even have to have some kind of religious exemption behind it. I think it's, if if I just don't like your face, you know, and I don't want to be a part of that because I don't like your face, I shouldn't have to now. If there's going to be some uh, repercussions, you know, if the, if the free market gets upset and, you know, my customers no longer like me because I, you know, discriminated against somebody for a myriad of reasons, whatever one it is, you know, I, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, the government should get involved. I think if I lose customers, that's, that's fine. That's a free market solution. I think that's uh, something important to discuss. But uh, let's be real here. You know, we're, we're being, you know, shouted down and yelled at from, what, you know, what I perceive to be the political left that you would disagree. But, uh, it, you know, we're, we're told that, you know, this is so important and so, you know, ridiculously, uh, you know, it's such an important issue. While at the same time, you know, we have negotiations going on with Iran who are literally killing homosexuals in the street. And, you know, it, it's it's ridiculous what's going on in the Middle East. And we ju- we're just supposed to ignore this. You know, it, don't worry about ISIS killing gays. Don't worry about Iran. Don't worry about this. Worry about bakeries. Worry about Memories Pizza. You know, I think it's just ridiculous, and it's a little bit hypocritical coming from that the, the left itself. I, I agree only because of the fact that it's like, look, if you're going to basically call out what you believe to be hypocrisy or what is wrong, then you clearly have to call out the Muslim faith in respect to homosexuality. Now, I'm not just calling out Muslims in general. I mean, you know, there are a lot of Muslims that are very good people and that do not discriminate on that basis. But I think the reason why people are really upset with the Christian faith is because it's a majority situation. And anytime you're dealing with the majority, it's a very insecure thing. They're on top. We're not. I want to bring people down because I want to bring people to my level. It's it's a misery loves company situation. And I think it's a very psychological approach as opposed to even a political or a sociological approach. I think people are more in tune with the idea that they don't like people who are in charge who do something that they disagree with, even though that there are other groups, organizations, individuals that do the exact same thing, if not way worse, to a community that they're trying to protect. And so when I look at it and say, yeah, I mean, very much so, the political left is very much in opposition to this Indiana law, whereas the political right might not be, I do think that the political right has done its own damage in terms of saying that with their own insecurity, you know, we believe that, you know, I mean, we need to stop or we need to protect marriage. We need to, you know, I mean, the whole drug war or when it comes to abortion or when it comes to any situation, when it comes to basically the government needing to be involved in people's lives, I think the religious right or just the right in general has done its own damage. So I'm not, I'm not necessarily... Um, picking a fight with the left, although with this particular issue, I think, you know, obviously I disagree with the left on this one, but I do believe that there are a lot of situations out there where the right has made its own problems, and a lot of times this is a response to it. Oh, and and I completely agree with you. And, and you know, for me, I will pick a fight with whoever is trying to to institute uh, more government force and coercion on people, Uh, you know, create more laws, more red tape for us. I'm a big fan of laws that create red tape for the government, Uh, negative laws that prevent the government from from influencing our lives and and trying to tell us how to live our lives. Uh, And for me, I, I, you know, 
you'll see me, you know, saying things about the left very frequently because I feel like that is the that is the side that is just continuing to to advocate for these kind of laws, draconian laws, where we're told, you know, how much of a big gulp we can drink. You know, uh, it, the only thing that they seem to be on the right side of for me is sometimes privacy, the privacy conversation, and sometimes, uh, well, usually the war on drugs. They are against it, but uh, other than that, though, I mean, it seems like everywhere I I, I look, the left is advocating for more government, bigger government. Oh, you know, socialist has, socialism and communism hasn't worked out so well in the past, but they did it wrong. We're going to do it right this time. And, and that's where right, I, yeah. th- that's where I have a problem with it. And if, it, if it's coming from the left, uh, I'll, I'll denounce it. If it's coming from the right, I'll denounce it. If it's coming from a libertarian, I'll denounce it. That's, but it, it just seems like it's like an open season on the left recently. Uh, recently, yes, and like I said, I think it is. In, I think it's in response to quite a bit of what was happening. I mean, it's always a teeter totter. It's always a situation where you know one side gets the power and then the other side fights to get the power. And so you're looking at that situation. The problem that I have with this is basically saying, based on the whim, we don't believe that people should be able to do certain things, and it just makes sense. Which is the kind of situation where I mean, I had a long time really good friend who was not anti-gay whatsoever, but he really believed that marriage was between a man and a woman, and so he thought that, you know, he was like, well, yeah, you know, this is the way that I thought, and this is the way that I believed. So the problem with it is, is when you try to get government involved, when you try to pass a law for it, because you better be careful what you wish for. You just might get it, and the more government that you have, eventually you're going to be the victim of it, and that's where I'm saying if you allow free markets to basically pick and choose the winners and losers of the situation, more often than not, it will happen in the favor of the truth versus in favor of the whim. You know, I mean, I, I just think someday this should be the way that it should be, and they ought to pass a law. Just be careful, because when you pass a law, you never, ever get rid of that law. I mean, almost 99% of the time. Mm-hmm. And so that's where I think the big disaster comes in when people start to say, well, we need to regulate thought hate crimes, you know, religious freedoms. I mean, all those situations when you start to really dissect what people are thinking and then try to get involved, that's when you get in major trouble. Outstanding. I I couldn't agree more with you, man. And and just so you know, I I really do appreciate you coming on. Uh, Would you do me a favor and just share with our listeners where they can go to check out your your company, uh, Quality Funds, and like Facebook, social media, all that good stuff? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so equalityfunds.com, and the idea is that Equality Funds in itself is – really what we call conscious capitalism or it's impact investment. We're trying to make an impact on the community in which we're investing. And so, in other words, we don't believe, or I personally, as the founder of the company, don't believe that a government should come in and dictate what you do with your own human rights or human resources practices. Your policies and procedures should be completely up to you and your company because I believe that in the long term, even though you'll have a major problem sometimes, you know, when it comes to discrimination, in the long term, the markets will work themselves out. And so we're investing in companies that we believe are trading people over their profits, and thus they will earn more profits. And again, over the past 15 years that we've done our research, empirical data has clearly shown companies that are more LGBT-friendly or companies that are more people-friendly in general are better performers in the market. And so hopefully we're enriching and rewarding companies that do this kind of behavior voluntarily versus being forced by the government to do so. And because of that, we believe that we'll make a bigger profit for our investors and our clients. Absolutely. So uh, what was the Facebook address? For, it was at uh, facebook.com uh, forward slash equality funds. Is that right? Equality funds, right. And a lot of people mistake equity funds versus equality funds. It's equality, which is what most of us are striving to get to, which we believe that the free market derives more equality than does government. If you try to push for equality in the government, you'll have neither freedom nor equality. But if you push for freedom, you'll have much more equality. There is no utopia, though, Mac. I mean, that's the problem with all of this, is that people feel as though somehow there's a magic bullet or a potion that you can go ahead and wave a wand with and then make everybody think the way that you can, that you, that you are thinking. And that's the problem, is, is that there's never going to be 
you know, 100% agreement on this kind of thing. And it's okay. I mean, honestly, I don't think that silencing your critics is a good thing. I like to have people that I disagree with. <laughs> exactly. You know, I, I appreciate the diversity of thought. I, I like being able to hear other people's opinions, honestly. And that's a, that's a big part of what we do in our, our Facebook group. By the way, those of you out there, if you want to join us, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash on the move show. And, and I usually just, I'll post articles about stuff that's going on and I'll ask our members, you know, what do you guys think? I'm really interested to get as many different takes on it because usually I have an opinion on it already but I kind of want to see where everyone else stands before I you know drop the hammer on what I think you know uh, but it's 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 interesting to see where people start out and then after you talk about it people will get to different places you know it, maybe we won't have a consensus but at least we had an educated thoughtful logical uh, conversation about it and I think that's the most important thing I, I'm a big fan of 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 not censoring people you know that the more conversation and debate about something the better in my opinion I totally agree and I mean it's it's almost I mean it's fortunate yet unfortunate that you and I are basically on the same thought process when it comes to this kind of thing because you know if we had somebody that completely disagreed with us hopefully we can have a logical discussion as opposed to just something emotional and irrational. I mean, that's the kind of thing where it's like, anytime you say the word discrimination, sometimes it evokes these emotions of, you know, horrible, horrible, evil people. And that's not really the way that it is, in my opinion. Most people are not intentionally anti-gay or intentionally bigoted. They're simply ignorant to what really is out there. And they, you know, in their own world, they haven't considered certain things. And so instead of slapping them across the face with a law or with the label of a bigot and hatred, you can really try to reach across the aisle and try to, you know, change the direction of the train, you know, getting inside the engineer's, you know, station as opposed to trying to hit it head on. And I think that that's the problem when it comes to the majority of our divisive politics is that we're basically trying to demonize and marginalize our opposition and then silence them as opposed to really listening to what it is that they have to say. Because, you know, most of these people out there, they're people that you like, that you know, that you love, you care about. They just might have different opinions based on their perspective and based on their experience mm -hmm. exactly and, and and i think again the diversity of thought is a good thing uh, i have no problem uh with somebody having another opinion the only it, my only issue is actions so if you are trying to actually do something to take away my rights or the rights of others then we have some issues and and at that point it's it's open season as far as i'm concerned but but hey mark i appreciate you joining us will you come back and join us again sometime I'd be happy to. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity, Matt. Oh, well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And uh, anyway, for those of you out there who would like to check out more about Equality Funds, you can do so uh, by going to Mark's website, equalityfunds.com, or looking him up on Facebook. Uh, that is, again, Equality Funds. And thanks again, Mark. I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Mac. Happy Easter and have a great weekend. All right, you too. Take care. All right, guys, so at this point, we're going to go ahead and cut to a quick commercial break. And when we get back, we're going to talk a little bit more about this RFRA stuff. I'll give you uh, some stuff that I haven't mentioned on it, uh, give you some final thoughts on this topic. And then we're going to move on to the Mac Attack segment. I want to talk about a lot of different issues. Uh, we got stuff where basically government gone wild, you know, people getting thrown in jail for ridiculous reasons. We got, you know, the, uh, the government basically declaring a, a you know constitutionalist terrorist we, you know we've talked about this again but uh it i want i want to list a few other articles there's some there's some topics i really want to focus on on this and uh anyway I, i'm really looking forward to this next segment so don't go anywhere guys you guys are going to really have a good time i think anyway we'll be right back i do solemnly swear that i will support and defend the constitution of the united states of america against all enemies foreign and domestic and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, pledging my life, my fortune, and my sacred honor. So help me God. Join us at OathGapers.org. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support.
Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services, from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashawurley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, Worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. Casting from deep within occupied territory on the far left coast, you're listening to On the Move with Mac Worley III. Stand up, speak out, and get on the move. But now your host, Mac Worley III. All right, we're back. So. Before we get into everything here, I, I want to actually uh, cover a weekly defender. We haven't done this in a little while, and I really do like doing these. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, if, if you've never joined the program before, this is a segment where we report about armed citizens in the news who have used their firearms to defend their family, their property, or, or themselves, something along those lines. So, anyway, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start the weekly defender, and then we'll move on to some of the other stuff here. And now it's time for Weekly Defender. You have the right to defend your life, the right to defend your family, and the right to defend your freedom. All right, our first Weekly Defender we found on insider.foxnews.com. And this was from April 5th, 2015. So I guess this is today. At 9.54 a.m. this morning. I'm guessing that's East Coast time for those of you out there. So, uh, anyway, a Georgia man with a concealed carry license is being hailed as a hero after preventing an attempted carjacking and possibly saving a woman's life. The harrowing incident was caught on surveillance camera at Fast Track Car Wash in Simran... See, I think it's somewhere in Georgia on Friday afternoon. When a teenager tried to steal a woman's car, she jumped on the hood to try and stop him from driving away. Witnesses say that prompted the alleged thief to speed up. A gun-toting bystander saw the chaos unfold and drew his weapon, shooting the thief in the shoulder. The guy that got shot, he was falling out of the car and was holding his chest and started shivering and shaking, and then he kind of flopped on the ground, witness Chris Roberts said. The armed bystander, a Simran, uh, Simran City employee, held the alleged carjacker at gunpoint until the police arrived. The suspect was transported to the hospital. He will be charged with, a, with felony aggravated assault and misdemeanor theft by taking of a motor vehicle. So there's a video on this. I'm not going to play it because it actually has an advertisement on it. And I don't want you guys to have to hear it, but basically, they just reiterate everything I just said to you. So, uh, you know, I, I think this is a, an interesting story, especially being that it was a, a government employee, a city employee that participated in this. I wonder if there will be any consequences for that employee uh, with his city job. Uh, those kind of things interest me because, you know, oftentimes we hear about repercussions like this that happen from armed citizens. You know, if, if they were uh, – there was one case I heard, I think it was at a CVS or something. Uh, the clerk pulled a gun on the guy and they had a, a no-gun policy for the uh, for the actual store so that their employees weren't allowed to have guns. And, you know, even though he defended the store and he protected himself uh, from a – so, some kind of robber. He was he was fired for that action. So you know, I hope that this doesn't come back and affect this guy negatively. You know, it's it's one of those things where you do have to kind of worry about your your good deed being punished. And it's it's really unfortunate that we live in that kind of society. Uh, it, it makes people not want to do things. I think my hat is off to this guy. Uh, you know, you put your yourself out there. You put yourself at risk every time you pull a gun. You are you're risking going to jail. You know that this this guy could have easily you know been prosecuted. Uh, you know, a DA or the police could have tried to make an example out of him somehow in some way. It, it, things like that happen, and it is very dangerous. You know, uh, for those of you out there who don't know, there's actually insurance uh, against this kind of stuff. Like if if you are involved in some kind of incident where uh, you were asserting your rights or something, and or, or defending yourself 
you know, the, the, there's all sorts of, uh, of insurance programs out there like that. Uh, one of these is I'll have to talk about them because I, I don't actually know them offhand and I don't have any. And it would be a good idea for me to get something like that. Uh, but anyway, uh, moving along to the next story here uh, is on the next weekly defender we found on the dailycaller.com. And this is from the 22nd of March. A uh, legal gun carrier likely saved several lives, including those of children, after another man pulled a gun and began shooting at a Philadelphia barbershop on Sunday, police said. Warren Edwards, 40 years old, was involved in an argument at Fala Barbershop around 3 p.m. A witness told WTFX that when a barber at, at the West Philadelphia business told Edwards to chill out, he pulled a gun and began shooting. Between 8 to 10 people were in the barber shop at the time, including children. Police said a customer who had, who had just walked into the barber shop pulled out his own gun and shot Edwards several times, hitting him in the chest. Edwards died on the way to the hospital. The person who responded was a legal gun permit carrier, Philadelphia Police Department Captain Frank Lewin said, according to CBS Philly. He responded, and I guess he saved a lot of people in there. Uh, could have been a lot worse if this guy, if it wasn't for the guy who responded and basically saved a lot of people in there, Lewin added. I take my hat off to him. It could have been a lot worse. There could have been a lot more people dead, Bianca Brown, who lives in the neighborhood, told WTFX. The concealed carrier turned himself, himself into the police precinct. It is unknown if he will face any charges, but it is believed that the shooting was a case of self-defense. So, again, every time you pull out that firearm... There are repercussions, you know. You you may go to jail, at minimum. You you will be in under investigation. So, you know, it's important to to know. It's important that people you know take the precautions. Uh, you know, I think I'm going to be looking further into this uh, this defensive gun use insurance. I think it, I think that kind of thing, especially if you open carry or you can still carry on a frequent basis. This this kind of thing is important. So. Anyway, that's our Weekly Defender. Uh, if you guys have any comments on it, please feel free to give us a call. The number to the show is 360-450-5625. Again, that number is 360-450-5625. Or you can email the show at talkingonthemoveshow.com if you have any comments on the stories, you would like to to tell us something that, that you've gone through a similar experience or something that you may have heard of. I'd be happy to have you guys on. So, again, feel free to email us or call us uh, or any other social media stuff. You can contact us on that way as well. So. Uh, anyway, earlier in the program, I was talking about uh, people who were arrested for what I believe to be just silly, stupid reasons. Um, the, you know, we talked about uh, the the man being put in jail for not mowing his lawn, and then you know this isn't arresting, but people getting fined for uh, having dog poop out there where they were DNA testing and, and whatnot. So, um, anyway, uh, you know, we we got some other stories here, and one of them I I just think is crazy. This has got to be. The, the most ridiculous story I've seen in a long time. Uh, this is a Yahoo News article about a garbage man who was sentenced to 30 days in jail for picking up trash too early. Too early. So he's working for the city, and he, I'm guessing he's working. Maybe this is a private contractor or something. But, uh, yeah, sentenced for 30 days for picking up, I'm guessing, woke, woke some people up. Uh, anyway, this is an article on yahoonews.com. Um, I'm looking for who it was written by, and it has no name. All right, so anyway, it says, well, this is garbage. A sanitation worker in an Atlanta sub suburb has been sentenced to 30 days in jail for working too early. Kevin McGill uh, had been working for only a few months for a company contracted to do sanitation work in Sandy Springs when he was cited for picking up trash just after 5 a.m. one morning, according to WSB-TV. That violated city ordinance, which limits trash pickup to between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. The statute is in place because residents have complained that early pickup disrupts their sleep. When McGill showed up to court uh, to answer the citation, Sandy Springs prosecutor Bill Riley sought the maximum punishment against him, 30 days in jail. This is unbelievable. And in a trashy move, a judge granted Riley the request. Fines don't seem to work, Riley told WSB. The only thing that seems to stop the activity is actually going to jail. Riley, who jailed another sanitation worker for the same infraction last year, said that residents swamp 911 with calls when trash pickups occur too early in the morning. Are you freaking kidding me? Come on, guys. Really? It, like, you really have to call 911 about somebody operating a trash machine outside? You, dumping your dumpster 
into their the back of their truck really i understand that can be noisy but at the same time it's also temporary it's not like he's out there mowing the lawn and taking an hour and a half or something he, he takes your trash and he moves on I, I think it's a little bit ridiculous that people just you can't put a pillow over your head you have to put this guy to jail for 30 days 30 days you know, again, this is this is what laws do, all right? Laws, when they come down to it, the maximum sentence is what you need to be concerned about. The, what is the worst punishment, reaction? What's the worst thing that can happen from this law? And ultimately, every law, though the very worst thing that can happen from every single law out there, even the stupid ones, like somebody picking up trash at 5 in the morning, doing their job. They're out there doing their job. They're being a productive member of society, doing their job. Yes, they maybe they were they jumped the gun. They were too early. Okay, all right. You may ha- you may have a few sleepless mornings, but tra- you know trash is only once a week. Trash day is only once a week. All right. It, I just I don't know. I understand this, but when push comes to shove, let's say this guy didn't want to go to jail. Let's say this guy you know it was fighting this kind of thing. This guy could be killed for picking up trash at five in the morning. Do you really think that somebody should be killed for picking up trash? Garbage? That's garbage. Anyway, it goes on. Uh, you know, the, the interview, they actually interviewed him. Uh, the solicitor said it's automatic jail time, McGill told WSB. Uh, he didn't want to hear uh, nothing I had to say. Uh, I said it's my first time. I was stunned. I didn't know what to think. I was shocked, he added. McGill, a family man, did not have an attorney during his sentencing. He pleaded no contest and took the punishment, agreeing to serve his 30 days spread out on the weekends. So he just goes in on the week. What is the point? Seriously, what is the point of this? 30 days punishment and you can you just do it on the weekend? He began certain, serving the sentence last weekend and will do so for 14 more. I just want this to be over, McGill told WSB. I'm away from my family, my wife, and she's got to take care of of the two little boys. And I have four dogs. Well, uh, that's just crazy right there. He's got four dogs. Who who would have that many dogs? That's. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm joking. I love dogs. Uh, McGill has an attorney now, and she believes the sentence is too harsh. Give him a warning, the lawyer Kimberly Brando told WSB. I mean, he's the employee. He's not the employer. Send him to jail. Send send him. I can't speak. Sentencing him to jail is doing what? It really, what does that accomplish? Think about it. What did that really accomplish? Putting this man in jail. You know, he, he's he's obviously not going all at once either. So it's kind of silly. I I just think this is kind of a silly punishment. Okay, I'll go spend a weekend in jail, fourteen, fifteen times. <laughs> I don't. I don't think that's going to be a very, a very effective deterrent uh, from from crime. But even still, I don't think this is really crime. This is maybe a nuisance, and you're going to put somebody in jail for doing their job, creating a nuisance once a week in your neighborhood that is temporary and probably lasts. How long does it take? I mean, I, I, how long have you ever seen your your trash man on your street? By the way, because I'm just going from my personal experience. Maybe you guys have different experiences, but. My trash men have never been on my street for more than 10 minutes at a time. I've never seen a trash man stay on a street for more than 10 minutes at a time. Maybe I'm wrong. And, you know, even not even on the street, but let's just say earshot. How long are they in earshot? Not very long. I, I can't even tell you. Like, I don't even, maybe I'm just a hard sleeper. I don't wake up to trash men. It doesn't wake me up. I don't know. But, uh, okay, so... I do think this is crazy. And what is this doing? Is this is this helping the public? No. I mean, now we've got to house this guy in jail, feed him while he's in jail. You know, if he has any medical problems while he's in jail, we're providing medical services to him. Uh, this is not a good law. That's just my opinion. Not a good law. Uh, okay, so I want to I want to talk more here. Uh, we're going to go into the the Mac attack segment, and, and I want to talk more about this RFRA. I hope you guys. Don't mind me beating you over the head with this stuff right now, but uh, you know this this stuff really bothers me, and it's something that I want to talk about. So we're going to go into this into the Mac attack where I talk about just outrageous events in the news and the RFRA and the hashtag boycott Indiana is one of those things. So anyway, here we go. It's time. All right, so 
let's let's talk about some things that we haven't really discussed here and, and during the conversation I had with uh, Mark Delphine, which, by the way, check out his stuff at qualityfunds.com. Um, anyway, you know, the, the hashtag boycott Indiana, I, I do look at this as – and let's just be clear. That I don't think that there's anything wrong with boycotting. And if you want to boycott, if you want to protest, go out do that. That's fine. But uh, I think this is – Less of a boycott, it, more of a screaming at your opposition, trying to get the government to play censor. This is fascism, I believe. Um, and, and a topic, a subject that really hasn't been discussed very often, I haven't really heard it very often, is, is states' rights in terms of this conversation. All right, What we see is hashtag boycott Indiana. People all around the country saying that they're going to boycott Indiana. They're not Indiana and Indian and people. Uh, Indi- well, what do you? What do they call you guys out there in Indiana? Anyway, Indianites. I, I don't know. I, I I don't have a clue. I've never I've never heard of that. But uh, you know, those that choose to reside in Indiana, <laughs> that's how we're going to say it. Uh, they they live in Indiana. These are the people that are are deciding. You know what laws they want. You know that the. the the people who live in the state, they, they're deciding what happens in their legislator. They put in their, their – the people that they elect, okay, and those people do the bidding of the people. That's the way it's, it's, it should go. But when you t- start talking about people in California, Washington, you know, what business is it of me living in Washington state out here, what Indiana does? That's their right to do to govern the way that they see fit. They can do whatever they want with the government as long as they're not violating people's civil rights. Now, let's let's point out here civil rights are protected against the government. We have negative uh, negative rights that the government can't violate like the constitution spells out. So it says, you know, you shall not infringe these rights. List them off, 1 through 10. Those are negative rights. The government can't violate those. It doesn't say anything in the Constitution about an individual violating the rights of another. Okay? It, it doesn't say that. But at the same time, this is not just us violating rights. Do you have a right to that cake? All right? Do, as Let's say a gay couple. All right? A gay couple comes in and they say... You know, we want that cake. We want you. And, and we're not talking about something that's already on a shelf. When it's not like they're walking in and they're buying a box of cookies, okay? And the, the store owner's saying, no, oh, I'm not going to serve you because you're gay. No, no, no. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about somebody going in and saying, will you make me a custom cake that is not on your shelves? I want you to make it specifically for me, for this situation, for this religious ceremony that is in violation of your religious rights. All right, that that is what they're saying. So, at what point does does one person's rights affect the rights of others? You know, it, your rights do not supersede the rights of others. So, your right to get married as a gay couple, your right to participate in your religious services of your choosing, uh, those do not supersede the rights of others to to not participate in that. Due, due to religious reasons, uh, that's one. But also, again, we're talking about the freedom of association. So I have, uh, I have a right to not associate with anyone I choose for any reason whatsoever. And I'll be damned if I'll let the government tell me that i got to associate someone because of this law, blah, blah, blah. No. If I don't want to associate with them, I'll take whatever punishment you got because I am not going to associate with those people. If, if I feel that strongly, for whatever reason... I mean, imagine the kind of problems that we're going to have. How many people will will go to jail because they just don't want to associate with somebody? How many people will die? Because if we're talking, as I mentioned before, if we're talking about religious people, people who believe in their religious convictions and are prepared to die for them, do you really think that this won't end badly for someone somewhere? Just look at Eric Gardner, all right? The Eric Gardner situation. Why was he killed? He was killed because of taxes. He wasn't giving the government his cut. That's why he was killed. They weren't purposely out there targeting because of because of his race, at least not in my opinion, and according to all the evidence I've looked at, they weren't targeting him because of his race. He was out there selling loose cigarettes and the government didn't get his cut. So Uncle Sam comes in and puts this guy in a freaking chokehold and the use of force that they applied was too much and this guy died. 
He died for not paying taxes, not giving the government their cut, which probably amounted to a few dollars. I, I want you to realize that he probably died for a couple of dollars. Overall, if, that, if those cigarettes would have had to be, been taxed, let's say he was out there standing on, you know, on the sidewalk selling cigarettes all day to people. How much money in taxes could that have been, selling one cigarette at a time? Couldn't have been much. Couldn't have been much. Eric Gardner died for taxes. That, I mean, I think this is the biggest cautionary tale, is that the government will kill you. If it's against the law for you to do something, the government can kill you over it. I mean, I, I, that has to be the biggest reason to, to not just say, you know, I, I don't do this. and I find this distasteful, but I'm going to say that we should ban this thing and the government should come after anybody who does this thing. Even though they're not hurting anyone and, and the, they're not depriving others of their rights, we should make this illegal. Uh, this, this to me, you know, I've been in that situation before. I've thought that thought. Everybody's thought that thought well, at one time or another, but you got to stop yourself. You got, oh, no, 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 no. Less government. I don't want the government involved. Keep the government out. There has to be a free market solution. There has to be. What is it? And we've talked about those free market solutions. You know, uh, Mark, he gave some really excellent points about uh, about the responses and, and also the dynamics between the free market. You know, if it, statistically, companies that treat their customers with respect and dignity do better. You know, those who don't do worse. That's a pretty good business platform. Treat your customers with respect and dignity. Respect their rights. You know, try, don't make them do things that they don't want to do. Don't don't discriminate against them. But when it comes to their rights, you know, it, 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 and your rights, when they come into contrast, you know, you shouldn't be forced to do something or associate with anyone for any reason that you don't want to. So, my my question here is: Why are people from the outside Indiana trying to tell? People who live in Indiana, how to run their state, you know. And again, I, I mentioned this before. I don't believe that the, this is about equality anymore. I, I, it doesn't seem like they're asking for equality. It seems to me like they're demanding special privileges. Like in this circumstance, your religious rights don't mean anything compared to my right to your time, energy, effort, business, food, whatever. You know, th this to me just is very similar and reminiscent of the of the Obamacare debate. You know, when you start saying that you have a right to health care, all right, I don't believe that health care is a right. I think it's a service. Just like a cake baker, that's a service. You don't have a right to that. No one has a right to your service. You know, it. it it's it's very frustrating to me to, to try to wrap my head around why they are on this tangent. And I, I really... I really don't believe that it's it's those that are just completely uninformed, at least not the ringleaders of this whole kind of movement. It's not those that are uninformed about it. It's those that – it's no longer about equality. It's they want you to actively participate in their lifestyle. It, they, they want it to be so ingrained in the society that you have to participate. It, just like it, you know, with, with abortion. You know, we have to pay taxes and somehow, some way – Tax money ends up at the Planned Parenthood, and Planned Parenthood it performs abortions. So, if you're against abortions, you are now funding it somehow. You know that th these these are things that happen and have happened. So, you know that's what I believe is happening in this circum circumstance. You know, it's it's not enough for you to just be tolerant of their lifestyles. You know, I everyone's lifestyle. You have to participate in this one. You have to uh, to actually join in on, on the ceremony. And, you know, I have nothing against if, if you want to be gay, be gay. That's I'm not gay personally. I, you know, I but if you want to be gay, that's fine. It, it, enjoy it. That's your life. It's your life to live. Who the hell am I to tell you how to live your life? You know, it, it, but that goes the other way. All right. Tolerance works both ways. You know, I, I'm completely intolerant of intolerance. So, you know, if, if you are telling me that. I have to capitulate to you. You, at the same time, have to capitulate to me. So if I have a religious belief and I don't want to violate those those beliefs and you want me to do something that would violate it, you should capitulate to me as well. Oh, we, you know what? Okay, I'll find someone else. Uh, you know, it, it, and it's – I think there's such a big difference between – you know, somebody who's just saying, you know, I, I don't want to serve you because you're black or because you're gay. I don't want to serve you, you know, or uh, – 
there's a big difference between that and, and somebody who's saying, you know, I, I apologize. If you wanted to buy some of, some of the pastries in my store or something that wasn't custom, you know, you, you, you're free to do that. But I can't make you a custom cake for the religious ceremony because doing that would violate a conviction that I strongly believe in. You know, and, and when it comes to the RFRA, this isn't – this is not about uh, discrimination just for random reasons. It's not. It really isn't. You have to have a verifiable conviction. You have to be able to prove that you have this conviction and it's not just something that you're pulling out on a whim here because you don't want to you want to discriminate against somebody. A judge has to be able to determine this. So, if you don't prove it to a judge, you can say you're in violation of the law. So, and you know, I, the, the conversation about it being Similar to Jim Crow laws, RFRA, I wholeheartedly disagree with that. I, I do not agree with it. I know some of you out there may think that uh, you know it is, but in terms of the Jim Crow law, this was the, the government being used to mandate discrimination and segregation. And this is not a mandated a mandate by the government. That that it is apples and oranges completely. You're talking about two different things now. This is somebody having a religious exemption, which I don't believe is far enough. But a religious exemption from from participating in activities and associations that they don't want to be a part of and that violates their religion and they can prove it in a court of law. So this is a big, big difference between Jim Crow where you could just, oh, hey, I'm sorry, uh, you're a black person and, you know, you got to come into the back door and sit in the, you know, the, the black only area. You're not allowed in the white only area. Uh, you know, it's a huge difference between those kind of laws where if a store owner, if, if in Jim Crow South, if a store owner violated that and said, hey, all right, you know what? I'm not going to segregate my restaurant. Those people would go to jail. Those people would go to jail if they did those kind of things. It was against the law. So, you know, I think we can all just agree that to, to use the coercive force of the government to force someone to violate their, their religious beliefs is completely intolerant, right? And immoral. I, I that's that's my my opinion anyway, uh, you know. But what if the shoe was on the other foot? Let let me ask the, those of you out there who disagree with me, and you know, I, I'm 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 happy to have a conversation with you guys on it. So if you would like to talk about it, please give me a call. The number to show is three six zero four five zero five six two five. Again, three six zero four five zero five six two five. Or you can email us at talk at on the move show dot com. But for those of you out there who, who disagree with me, you know, this situation can be reversed very, very easily. And, and let me just ask you, should uh, a bakery owned by an African-American, should that bakery be forced to bake a cake for, for example, let's say the KKK? This isn't a religious exemption, all right? This is, this is just, you know, you don't want to be a part of the, this, this situation. You have a freedom of association, right? So should they be forced to bake a cake for the KKK? Well... This has already actually been asked and answered. Uh, this is, you know, one of those things that kind of happens. Uh, and this is a uh, WashingtonWeeklyNews.com, okay? Uh, this article uh, posted three days ago. Um, I'm trying to find out who this was written by. It doesn't have a name on it. I, you know, I really hate it when I can't find a name on articles. That's frustrating. I want to give them credit. So anyway, uh, the article uh, labeled Unintended Consequences, Black Bakery Owner Loses Lawsuit, Forced to Bake Racist KKK Cake. So this situation, this is apparently not a joke, okay? A Georgia court recently found that a bakery who happened to be owned by a, a – to be a – Wait a minute, I'm sorry, I lost my train here. Thought here, a, ba a Georgia bakery uh, recently found uh, that a baker who happened to be black was guilty of discrimination because she refused to bake a racist cake for an upcoming KKK gathering. And this is not a joke. Uh, a Georgia court ruled in favor of Marshall Saxby, the Grand Wizard of the local KKK chapter, in a lawsuit stemming from two years ago when a local baker denied him service. The three-judge panel concluded unanimously that the baker had violated civil rights laws by discriminating against Saxby when he refused. I'm sorry, when they refused to sell him a cake for his organization's annual birthday party. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding? You cannot. You cannot agree with this. You cannot agree with this. Is this is wrong? Now, I personally don't give a crap if a, if a racist is not able to get. Their, their KKK cake made anywhere. I guarantee you somebody would make it. Or, you know what? Why don't you make it your damn self? All right? That's just, that's my opinion. All right? But uh, why would they go to a, a, a place that obviously 
disagrees with them? Why would they go to a black-owned bakery and try to force a black-owned baker to bake them a KKK cake? Obviously, they're trying to make a statement. Obviously, they're trying to throw their weight around and say, look, we can make you do whatever we want you to do. They're using the laws against against them here, and this is this is wrong. This is intolerant. This is intolerant of the freedom of association. Now, I think this is wrong on this side. I think it's wrong on the other side. Forcing people to, to give services is saying, if you're saying that I have a right to your service, you're saying that I have a right to your time, your energy, your toil, which you don't have a right to. I have a right to say no. I have a, I have a right to say, uh, I'm going to abstain from this, this business opportunity. Thank you. Maybe somebody down the street will be able to help you. Now, and I don't believe that we need a religious exemption for that purpose at all. I think that this isn't uh, this uh, just a re- religious exemption with the RFRA. I don't believe this is enough. I do not believe this is enough. So, anyway, you know, th- this ultimately, I believe, this comes down to the, the freedom of association again. You know, and, and what is the freedom of association? It, it's it's your right as an individual to join or leave a group uh, for whatever reason of your own choosing, and for the group to take collective action to pursue the interests of its members. So we all have the freedom of association. This freedom, it was never given to us by the government because, again, governments, they don't give us rights. They do not give you rights. All right. However, this natural human right, in particular, the freedom of association, it, it has actually already been uh, d- interpreted by the Supreme Court to be protected by the First and Fourteenth Amendment of the Constitution. So, so why is this up for debate? Again, this isn't about equal rights or tolerance anymore. This is about totalitarianism. This is about weaponizing the government against the political left's political opposition. So, you know, th- they're using the government in a fascist kind of style where they target their enemies. You know, I look at this as an assault on freedom of association, freedom of speech. This is no different, in my opinion, than the IRS being used to target Tea Party organizations during an election year. That's the way I look at it. This is the same thing, the same kind of tactic. This is another case of the left saying, you're either with us or you're against us. And if you're against us, we will destroy you and everything that you stand for. We'll destroy your livelihood and your reputation. This is the left declaring that it's no longer good good enough for us to be tolerant of their lifestyles. You know, they, even if we don't subscribe to them, you know, it's not enough for us to just be tolerant of lifestyles that we don't participate in. Uh, Now we have to be active participants if demanded. You know, additionally, one other thing here, if if you disagree with me on this, let me ask you, do you believe that this gay baker, I'm sorry, (laughs) do you believe that this baker who refuses to, to make a cake for, for a gay wedding, you know, something that they have deep verifiable religious convictions, do you think that they should be thrown in jail? Because, I mean, if they didn't violate it, they they could go to jail for this. You know, if if they decided, you know what, I'm I'm not going to violate my religious convictions no matter what, do you think that they should be thrown into jail? And if so, how long? I'm just curious. What is an appropriate prison sentence for this kind of uh, crime? What, What do you think would be appropriate? Also, I'm just curious... Uh, do you think that if push comes to shove that this person should be killed? If they decide, you know, if if, if they decide to go into some kind of uh, active resistance where they're hanging on to a table and they're not going to be taken into jail and then they get put into a chokehold and, and die because of the force being put upon them, do you think that they, they should be killed if that, if that happens? Because, you know, we're not talking about Sunday Christians here. You know, we're talking about people who are deeply religious Americans. You know, it, whatever religion it is, they're deeply religious and committed to it, committed enough to where they would make a bad business decision of of possibly letting the free market hurt them. You know, like all these people coming up against them from the left, uh, the, the you know, gay activists or whatever out there, uh, you know, equal rights activists, all these people coming together to shout these people down and make them look bad in the media. Obviously, that's not a good business decision, as, as Mark Delphine was talking about. So why would they do that? Why would they put themselves in this position? It's easier for them to lie. But we're talking about deeply religious people who even believe that lying is a sin. So they're not going to do that either. So what we're asking them is, is 
to either lie or to potentially die for their beliefs. Lie or die. And if you are a true believer, you're not going to lie. It's, that's against your religion too. So you have to tell the truth. How do you think this uh, kind of situation will go down when there's people that are committed to their convictions that will possibly die for them? You know, I think this is going to end badly. You know, if this kind of tyranny of the majority is allowed to continue, I believe that somebody will die. Mark my words. Someone will die. We will hear about some baker being dragged out onto a sidewalk and put into an illegal choke and die the same way that Eric Gardner died. I, I have a major problem with this. I don't believe that these people deserve to die for their beliefs. Uh, and that is what laws are. You know, it's, it's rules that if someone breaks, they can ultimately killed, be killed by the government for breaking said law. So, you know, and, and I think that it's good that we know who our bigots are. I want to know. I don't want them to lie or die. I want them to tell the truth. I want them to, to be held accountable for their words and their actions. Wouldn't you rather know, want to know? I mean, I personally, I would rather want to know that, who the racists are, sexist, bigots. You know, I, I, that, that's, that's my personal opinion, you know. What is it to stop one of these store owners from lying about why they won't serve you? It, let's just say it's not religious at all. It's just they don't like black people. Oh, you know what? Hey, a black guy comes in. Uh, sorry, we're out of cake mix. We can't, you know, sorry. Oh, I'm taking vacation on that day. Sorry. You know, I would rather know. I would, I would rather know that you're a racist than you just to come up with some kind of bullcrap excuse as to why you can't serve me and then I move on to somebody else. I want to know. Because I think the free market is a better solution. I think people will decide that, okay, well, you know what? I don't want to give my business to this bigot. I'd rather give it to the guy down the street that will you know, serve me, and I'll tell all my friends about it. And then all my friends may decide never to go to that place again, and maybe to get on the, the, the news or social media, things like that. All these, these things are important, and it will have an impact. So I think there are answers to it other than the government. I think it's a bad idea to involve the government in this kind of situation. It's a recipe for disaster in my opinion. Uh, anyway, I I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say on this. Please feel free to give us a call. The number of the show is 360-450-5625. Again, that number is 360-450-5625. And we'll be right back after this commercial. Oath Keepers is a nonpartisan association of current active duty military, reserve, guard, veterans, peace officers, and firefighters who will fulfill the oath we swore with the support of like-minded citizens who take an oath to stand with us to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So help us God. Join us at OathKeepers.org. on the move help us make this podcast bigger and better you can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products all designs are original and made for patriots like you just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show we appreciate your support Hi, I'm Tasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services, from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashaworley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. Casting from deep within occupied territory on the far left coast. You're listening to On the Move with Mac Worley III. Stand up, speak out, and get on the move. And now your host, Mac Worley III. Alright, we're back. So... 
We were talking about the RFRA. We were talking about all sorts of different stuff related to Boycott Indiana and this this whole thing. You know, I want to get some of your guys' take here on the RFRA and see what you guys had to say. Uh, we posted a conversation regarding this in our uh, Facebook group. So, again, anybody out there who would like to join, that's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash on the move show. So you can participate in the conversations that we have every week. So I posted a article here about this Religious uh, Freedom Act opening the door for the first church of cannabis. And um, like I said, I, I personally am a, um, a believer that the war on drugs is, is a big failure. It's, it's a horrible, horrible for liberty, in my opinion. The government shouldn't have any say of what you put into your body. That's just my personal opinion when it comes to, to drugs. I I think that this is more of a issue of personal responsibility. You need to take responsibility for your actions. You know, if people violate laws, for example, if they if they go out and rob people because they're on drugs, well, that action, robbing people, is already against the law. Uh, the drug is not what it what should be punished for them violating the law. You see what I mean? They, they need to take personal responsibility for their actions, decisions. And it's just like, I wouldn't for, for like gun control. And this is kind of what I look at the whole thing. You know, you're, you're blaming an inanimate object. So I don't blame the gun for gun violence. I don't blame the drug for doing some kind of crime after somebody took a drug. You know, I, I, I blame the individuals for those, just like I wouldn't blame a car, you know, for a bad driver running somebody over or, or, trying to kill somebody unless obviously it just you know something wrong with the car you know but um and just like i wouldn't blame your fork for making you fat you know you made you fat <laughs> that's those are the reasons why i look at it like this is it's it's all about actions and and people taking responsibility for their actions and their words i think that that's very very important uh but anyway um we had a bunch of comments here uh, about this, and I'd like to I'd like to read some of these here. So somebody disagreed with me. Um, let's see, we, we got one of our uh, our listeners here. His name's Donald. He said, uh, "Mac, the next thing you know, they'll be forcing us to bake cakes for." Uh, I'm not going to say that word. And letting them drink from our water fountains. Uh, okay, so you know he he would disagree with me. Obviously, you know every you guys are all entitled to your opinion, and I, I really do appreciate you guys sharing it with me. I wanted to read. Some of the ones that uh, that disagree with us, and then another one here, uh, John. He says, uh, "When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have been connected, uh, which have, which have connected them with one another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitles them, a descent." Or, yeah, a dissent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the cause causes which impel them to uh, them to the separation. So, sorry, I'm having trouble reading right now. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The opening lines to the Declaration of Independence. That is all I have to say on the subject. So, that was John. You know, look, I, I understand, but at the same time. You know, we we have the the whole situation I've talked about. I don't want to get all the way back into this argument and debate. Maybe I should have done this first. But, you know, I, I look at this as my rights versus your rights and where they come together and where where's the problem, you know. So if I just don't want to, you know, do business with somebody, it, what if they're in the KKK, I, you know, and I don't want to associate with members of the KKK? I shouldn't I shouldn't be forced via government force to to actually have to do something or affiliate with that person. If, if I just decide that I don't want to deal with that person for whatever reason, I shouldn't be forced. That's all I'm saying. And I think to force somebody to do something is coercion, obviously. And to use the government to, to initiate that coercion is, is immoral. I think it's wrong. That's just me. Uh, so, you know, we had a bunch of other conversations about it. And, you know, uh, let's see here. We got... Uh, Jessica, she said, the lady with the bakery was the gay guy's friend for years. All she said was, I can't provide you your wedding flowers. And he went off the deep end and completely ran her out of business, her, her business into the ground. Uh, they were even offered free flowers from multiple other companies, but they gunned for her. She was tolerant of him just like she would have been. Uh, or, sorry, yeah, she was tolerant of him just like she should have been. Uh, but she believed that it would be against her faith and her conscience to provide them flowers for their wedding. The guy threw a fit, and instead of going elsewhere, he ruined another's reputation, which, being friends, he should have known her stance on it. And when they could have uh, just went elsewhere, I'm 
I'm tolerant of everyone, but I'm not going to bend to what they want me to because they don't like my, what my faith limits me to do. So, I, you know, I, I, I actually agree with that, honestly. It, you know, it, and again, I, I often find myself on sides where I'm not, I don't even have a dog in this fight. First of all, I'm not gay. I'm not a business owner. So this doesn't really affect me. But I, I really don't like the whole idea of forcing people, you know, the majority or maybe just a very loud minority screaming down their opposition and forcing people to do something. You know, th- this is not about political correctness. This is not about equality anymore. This is about capitu- capitulation and and really just, you know, demonizing your opponents, forcing them to do what you want them to do. And, and while at the same time, like, like we talked about, the left is completely ignorant to the fact that Iran is killing homosexuals in record numbers. You know, they're dying right now in the streets. They're dying. But, you know, we're negotiating with them on a nuclear treaty. Okay. And, oh, by the way, it's a nuclear treaty that's not even legally binding. So, what are we doing it for? What's the purpose? And we've already busted all the deadlines on it. So, we're we're way out, out out there now. What is the point of this this whole thing? You know, it, we're we're allies with Saudi Arabia, who's doing the same thing, treating treating homosexuals the same way. You know, what about these rights? You know, what about the the rights of these people to live? Again, the, these rights that we have here in this country, it's so important that we we realize that these are not just our rights. These are the rights of everyone, every human. These are natural human rights. Some would say they're just there in nature. Some would say they were endowed upon us by our creator. Either way, they, they're there. And they weren't just given to Americans. They, they were given to all of us. So I find it a bit hypocritical that we cozy up to people who do not, do not respect human rights. I think that should be a requirement for us to, to cozy up to somebody is, is to actually make sure that they are you know, people that we want to be affiliated with. That, oh, what is that called? It's the freedom of association. Oh, yes. And I seem to recall something about our founders saying, beware of foreign entanglements. You know, it's it's great to be nice and on good terms with people. That's great. But to consider someone your ally, to provide someone with military arms is another story entirely. And aid, foreign aid that we provide these people. Unbelievable. It... it It's unbelievable that we give them billions and billions of dollars while they are treating homosexuals this way. Unbelievable. You would think that would be a requirement. Oh, uh, hey, before I give you billions and billions of dollars, since we're such good friends, right? uh, How about you stop killing all the homosexuals? Just, Just an idea. Just throwing it out there, you know? If you don't like it, throw it back, right? Look, that's just kind of the the way I look at it in in my mind here. It's, it's a clear it's a clear choice. Okay, we can continue to support these totalitarian regimes and give them money while they are doing these acts, or we can hold them accountable for their words and their actions and stop. That's my opinion, and I'm I'm happy to hear your guys' opinion. You're probably gonna have to do it on the next show or through email or on our social media somewhere because we're running out of time. We got about eight minutes left in the show. Um, before we go though, I want to cover just a couple other topics here. Um, we had a conversation about polygamy, and um, so it, I, I'd like to actually read some of your responses, uh, some of the MacPack responses out there because I thought it was a really good conversation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, but we, we had a poll on there, all right? So I, I said, uh, here's a good topic. It's sure to start a good debate. Uh, polygamy, should it be against the law? Explain why below. And uh, I let you guys vote on it. So out of the the options to vote for, it was no, yes, and maybe. Uh, or, I'm sorry, no, yes, I don't know. That's what it was. And um, anyway, out of this, we had 10 people who voted no, it shouldn't be illegal, and five people who voted yes, it should be. And let's see what some of your responses were. Uh one of, one of our members here said, probably because my Christian faith does not say uh, marry as many as you can tap in a month. Then another one says, uh, let's see here. If a man is going to have multiple wives, he should have to earn them the old-fashioned way. Messy divorce, alimony, and loss of assets for each one. And anyway, I thought that was pretty funny. Um, yeah, other person said, I'll stick to one. Uh, and 
another another one said here this is another good one here uh, yes it should be illegal because not a lot of people have the mindset to be able to withstand this type of relationship people are jealous and tend to get catty so all right, so so this is a bunch of a uh, bunch of opinions here on the subject. Also, uh, you know, I, I was reading some of the negative ones here. Uh, here's another one. We got a. Uh, I don't think the state should be regulating marriage at all. I'm very traditional. I don't believe in divorce or remarrying after divorce. I don't support so-called gay marriage, nor do I support polygamy. I support traditional marriage, but that is between me and my fiance and our church. Uncle Sam doesn't get a say. People have been getting married long before the government decided they got to control yet another major part of our lives. Abolish marriage licenses altogether and get the state out of our business. So I got to say, that is awesome. That's a, I, I like that. So, you know, again, marriage, marriage licenses, marriage certificates, all of these things, they were not there to begin with. All right. This, this stuff was created as a way to prevent African-Americans from marrying whites and vice versa. So uh, this is a this is a tool of totalitarianism. This is a tool of tyranny marriage licenses and the state has no business whatsoever being involved in a religious ceremony we're supposed to be free from state state uh, involvement in our religious beliefs again we have a first amendment right those are negative rights the government's not allowed to be involved in it but yet they are they are it's you know they've interpreted our rights away year after year we keep losing rights they keep taking things and and one thing you really have to understand when, when it comes to the constitution and this is something that, that I really had to learn over the past few years here. Um, I started out with the whole idea that the Constitution was, you know, this this idea of freedom and liberty that everyone can do what they want and not and be free, you know, free from the government harassing them and and you know just totally dominating their lives, controlling every aspect of your life. But it's really not. It, it, it really isn't when you think about how it works. Now, yes, it is. It is this idea. I believe in the idea, but I completely disagree with the way it works. And it works through case law and precedent. That's why precedent, and I'm not saying president is the president of the United States. I'm saying precedent. You are creating a precedent for something to happen. That's why it is so dangerous when new precedents get created in case law. So, for example, you know, we've, we've mentioned in the past uh, the... Um, the Wickard v. Filburn case, where after the New Deal, uh, President, uh, the president of FDR, he wanted to actually uh, pack the courts because the courts weren't doing what they wanted him to do or what he wanted them to do. Uh, they were finding all of his legislation, the New Deal legislation, unconstitutional. So he threatened to pack the courts to like 15 or 16 justices on the court to get his way. So they changed their minds and they started passing his legislation and saying that they were they were constitutional totally changing their minds. Uh, Wickard v. Philpern was one of the first big ones on that, and it made it so that they could regulate interstate commerce that was, uh, get this, it's not commerce by the definition of the word. Uh, commerce means, you know, a business. Transactions are being made, those, those kind of things, commerce. Uh, and interstate, obviously, is stuff between the states. So, uh, Wickard v. Philburn was a case between an Ohio farmer that was growing wheat and it exceeded his his uh, quota, his consumption quota. I'm sorry, his his growing quota that he was allowed to make. He wasn't allowed to grow any more past this certain cap. But he grew more, and he said, "Oh, everything else is for. I'm not going to sell. I'm just going to use it for personal use. I'm going to feed my livestock, all that stuff." And the the Supreme Court came in and reinterpreted the the Constitution to where, oh, uh, hey, we can we can regulate through interstate commerce clause we can regulate something that is not interstate nor is it commerce and this is this is the precedent this is the kind of thing i'm talking about they they create these precedents and then it expands and it goes further and goes further and goes further and it's the constitution is not about the document anymore you read the second amendment you would understand that they're not allowed to touch your right to keep and bear arms they, they can't touch it it's not to be infringed upon so is that how things are? No, that's not how it is because the Supreme Court, they start to interpret things and they say, OK, well, we'll create this precedent. You can you can violate that portion of the of the Second Amendment. We can you can violate that right in this way, uh, you know, just like freedom of speech. You're not allowed to yell fire in a movie theater. It all starts to steamroll. Eventually, they, they get footing here. They build on that. And they get footing somewhere else. And they build on that. And eventually, you look around and you don't even recognize your freaking country. People are being forced to bake cakes for members of the KKK. <laughs> I don't recognize the country anymore. And it scares me. It really does scare me. This kind of precedent, 
scares me. We need to stand up against this. We need to continue to fight. It's not enough to to just know how you feel, you know, and and not speak out against things that you disagree on. You know, e- even if you don't have a dog in the fight, you know, I, I, that's why I speak out against this kind of stuff. I don't have a dog in this fight, but I don't want it to get build it, it build and build and build and build to the point where. There's no liberty left. You know, they say, you know, that old saying in World War II, they came for the communists. I wasn't a communist. They came for these people. I wasn't a, I wasn't part of those people, so I didn't speak up. They came for the Jews. No one was left to speak out, so, you know, I, I was taken. So th- th- those kind of things. It's <laughs> – I paraphrased that, and that was horrible. I'm sorry. But, but, yeah, you get the gist of it. We all have to stand up for each other's rights. It's not just going to be – it's not okay just to stand up for what, what rights that, that are affecting you, what, what violations are affecting you. You have to stand up for others, even if it's something that you don't have a dog in the fight. Anyway, that's my take on it. I really appreciate you guys sticking with me for today and, and, and you know joining our conversation that we had here. Um, anyway, I just want to say thanks first and foremost to Mark Delphi for joining us on the program. Uh, he's welcome back anytime. Thanks again, Mark. And for you guys, members of the Mac Pack, for tuning in week after week, you guys are the tip of the spear. Thank you, and we appreciate your continued support. Don't forget to tune in next week. We broadcast every Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, that is 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, don't forget to tune in uh, at Haywire Gulch. By the way, for those of you on Haywire Gulch, Patriot Radio is coming up next, so don't go anywhere. Anyway, don't forget to check us out at onthemoveshow.com here at blog, or I'm sorry, here at speaker.com forward slash onthemoveshow.com or on the move show, facebook.com forward slash on the move show, youtube.com forward slash on the move show, and twitter.com forward slash on the move show. And as always, know your rights, assert your rights, and get on the move. <laughs>